I am from the Cody First Nation and my name is Tony Cody. I'm 72 years old and a Korea War veteran. Can you tell me your battalion or regiment? I was with the 81st Field Regiment, Royal Canadian Artillery. How long were you enlisted in the Army for? I was in the Army for six years. How old were you when you joined? I was 17 years old. Were you involved in active duty or peacekeeping? I was in both. I went into active duty in Korea in 1953. Seen action there, participated in action in Korea from 1953-54. I was 14 months in Korea. And as for peacekeeping, I went to Germany in 1955-57. That is a keep peacekeeping role there. What, what prompted you to join the Army? Oh, I think I, uh, I admired when, I, when the Second World War veterans first, come, first came home or when they went to war in the early 40s and then they came home in 45. I used to admire them coming home and hearing some of their stories and whatnot, and I always thought, well, I should give it a try. If I ever get a chance to join the Canadian Armed Forces, I said, I'll join the Canadian Army, and I did in 1952. And it was, it was very challenging. It was an experience, and I learned how to be independent. I had learned how to be on my own, look after myself, and be able to uh, integrate into the white system. I came out of a residential school where we were all segregated and you were kind of timid and uh, wasn't very, very forceful in uh, trying to explain yourself and what that, but you learned leadership, discipline, and everything like that in the Canadian Army. Were you living on reserve prior to or at the time of signing up? I was uh, just come right off the reserve, just a young kid coming off the reserve. What was that like? Oh, off the reserve, well, the reserve life was quite, quite hard at that time. In the, from, the, from the time that I was going to school, I was in a residential school, and then I got out of the residential school and tried to make a living on the reserve, and his employment was very, very scarce on reserves at that time. You got seasonal work, you worked for farmers, you worked at harvest time. If you got lucky, you got a job in town, but they were very scarce, so somebody had to do something, and I didn't have that much of a, an, an education. I had a substandard level of education from the residential school. So I thought I'd give the armed forces up. A try and I succeeded in being accepted to go into the Canadian Army. What was the experience like for you to go from a reserve setting to another environment like to a foreign country? It's really something different even when you first get into your first uh, where you take your boot camp or basic training in Camp Shiloh was where I took my basic training in April of 1952. And it was altogether different. The, uh, the way of life was different. You had to be, uh, you had to act like a soldier and be start training to be uh, a soldier in uniform and in a strict discipline. But it was not as tough as it was it used to be at the residential school. The residential school was tougher, so there's nothing for me to be in the army to take all that crap of discipline and regimentation and um, getting direction from the NCOs, the sergeants and corporals and the lieutenants. So it was, it made it, it, it was easy in Canada when I first started. It was just nothing but, uh, it was kind of funny really. And then uh, when I went to Korea, it was altogether a different, uh, different lifestyle there. The people were poor. I thought we came from a very poor poor background, but when we got to Korea, I realized there was, uh, those people were very poor. There was children running on the streets, um, along the troop train begging for food and everything like that, and 
hardly any clothes on them, uh, five, six-year-old kids there begging for food, and they're in starving. They're, well, their country was at war, and the, their houses were being demolished, had been demolished by uh, bombs, artillery shells, and everything else like that. So they, I, I used to wonder, I wonder where those poor kids sleep at night. But as soon as a troop train would come along, they'd all appear. They would all appear with their hands sticking out and begging for food, water, whatever that. And the troops used to send them there. We used to carry sea rations. We had sea rations in our, in our packs and whatnot. And we would send our, through the, uh, the, uh, the food that we had in our sea rations to them. And they would all make a mad dash. The, the, the city of Seoul, which is the capital city of uh, South Korea, was, that was totally demolished by bombs from, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, bombs from the Americans and the Russian, Chinese airplanes and whatnot. And you see people going around, starving, hardly any clothes on, and really looking for food and begging here and there. So it's really tough to see people in that kind of, uh, uh, in, in, in that stage where they have absolutely nothing to eat and uh, hardly any clothes at all. It made me think, it made me really think, and I, uh, I used to think uh, it was poor from where I came from. Then I realized that here in Canada, we are very lucky, we are very fortunate, even though the Indians at that time were also considered to be very, very poor. But after seeing the situation in Korea, when I arrived there, in April of 19, no, in March of 1953, then I realized that we are much better off, the Canadian Indian people are much better off than the South Koreans in Korea. Have you applied for vet veterans benefits or services from Veterans Affairs? Yeah, I did. When I got my release, I did, I did apply, but I was one of the veterans that didn't really get anything. Other veterans got all kinds of uh, benefits, post-war benefits, what we call post-war benefits. We're in the same, situ same situation as our First World War and Second World War veterans from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the reserves. I don't know why they treated us different. And all of us say that we went and fought with our white brothers side by side. We did the same thing as they did. We were assigned to the same kind of dangerous duties. We did everything that they did. We drug, we dug trenches, we shared trenches with them. And some of us got taken prisoners of war, some of us got wounded, some of us got taken prisoners of war. And then when uh, most of the veterans, Indian veterans got their discharge, they were treated altogether different and uh, even though they said that there would be post-war benefits and uh, payments for after you don the uniform off, it didn't turn out that way. A lot of a lot of the veterans, and I was one of them that didn't get anything. I got uh, all I got from my for my uh, for stint in the army was one hundred and ten dollars, and it was called the reestablishment re grant of one hundred and ten dollars, and that's all I ever got. I wanted to, I wanted to push, pursue a higher level of education. I knew Veterans Affairs had monies, funding for white veterans, where they, a lot of them went back to university, went back to college.